ladies and gentlemen, I'm having a problem with this. The more I read this article and the more I talk about it, the angrier, angrier I am getting. I'm back. Hey, everybody. Weasel here in time for another video cast. Yes, I've been corrected. I always call it a podcast, but somebody told me I need to stop saying that. This is actually a video cast. So welcome back. I'm back from hiatus. I'm glad to be back. It's been what, two, a little over two months since uh, the last video cast. And for that, I apologize. I've been very, very busy. Things have been crazy. I love how we uh, get into politics and we look at the news of the day and read and see what's going on. I do want to let you guys know that I now have two new podcast. excuse me, I almost did it again, two new video casts coming out. Um, and that's partly why I've been gone because I've been working on that very hard, but it's still not ready. Um, but here soon it will be ready, and that way I can keep it consistent as well. I'm really trying hard. One of them, I think, is going to be, be the best one so far, and that is we're, I'm calling it Project Blackfish, and that it was is with regard to the dark net and the deep web. I think you'll find it very informative. We learn the history of it. We learn how it works. We get to to um, search it, look into it, find all types of crazy stuff, find the sickos out there, find the real dark, intriguing things going on. And I think you guys are really going to like it. So, um, And the second one is, um, as you've heard me mention in previous uh, video casts, I'm a real estate investor. Um, I invest in a large portion of this country. And I thought, you know, what if I could show everybody how I do what I do? Because I get so many people asking me, well, how do you do that? How do you do that? How do you do that? And it's like, man, I ain't got hours to sit down with you and take you through it all. You know, I get all these people who want me to be their mentors and they want me to teach them. And there's a lot of people I do that for. However, it's wearing me down. It really is. It's wearing me down. So now I am going to start a video cast and I'm going to try and make it very entertaining, not only uh, educational, which is the whole point, but I want to make it entertaining. Um, so I'm really taking my time with it, trying to do it right. Either way, um, you guys need to check those out. Uh, they will be coming out here soon. Uh, the only way you'll really know, because I don't have a big presence or anything, I am on Twitter. Uh, you could follow me at the Weasel on Twitter, of course. But um, is to subscribe here. Hit the dong, the 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 notification bell, the dong, as the Angry Joe Show would say. <laughs> dong the ding the dong. That's how he says it, which is genius, by the way. <laughs> Joe, I am stealing it. I love it. Um, hit the bell, guys. That way you get the notifications, and that way I can let you know when they're out and where you can find them. I really do think that they will be great. Uh, that being said, today I'm not really prepared for a podcast. I don't have uh, something to really preface today's video cast. Excuse me, I said podcast again. Video cast with anything. Um, we're just going to kick back and do it old school. We're going to see what's in the news today and cover some politics and just look into it, hear my thoughts on it. It's been a while since I've done one, like I said, a couple months. So please bear with me. It may not be my best video cast that I've ever done. Either way, let's have some fun. Let's talk about it. Comment, like, subscribe, all that jazz. You know what to do. And the first thing I want to go to, this is out of the realm of what we normally talk about. And I think I came across this uh, this little piece at National Review, an, a very good medium, by the way. Check them out, National Review. And here we go. And I want to talk about this one for a minute. And first, let me preface with, in no way whatsoever do we take lightly LGBTQ, I think that's how you say it, LGBTQ, transgender, any identity, uh, politics, we don't take any of that lightly. Um, we don't laugh at people. We don't look down at them. They're people just like, just like us. We love them either way. Um, so I just want to preface with that. If I, I want some comments on this, this topic, though. I want to know what everybody's thinking. That way, maybe I can go ahead and do some more on it, start doing some serious research. And we'll start the discussion. But remember, be tactful. Okay? These are people who have changed their gender or um, their sexual identity and whatnot. I've never experienced it myself. 
I don't really know. I can't relate all that well. I can't fully comprehend it. But I can also understand the great conflict going, up, going on internally inside somebody when they come into this, this, this kind of an issue where they question their gender or they question their sex. Um, and then you also have a mainstream society who frowns upon it, which that's slightly changing, of course, now. Um, but you get my point. I can, I can appreciate that conflict. And I, I find it interesting. I really do. Like I said, though, however, I can't really relate. So let's get into this because this kind of threw me back, this article here, whenever I found this out. It threw me, it took me aback. I will say that right now. And I think it'll do the same for you. Okay. Pediatricians group urges acceptance of children's preferred gender. Yes, that is correct. I just said children's preferred gender gender and this article is at national review um it's written by myriad mccardle and myriad if i said your name wrong please forgive me uh thank you for the article we appreciate it <coughs> excuse me the american academy of pediatrics released new guidelines on monday urging parents to accept the preferred gender identity of their children urging parents to accept the preferred gender identity of their children. I know, right? I know what you're thinking. Me too. Me too. In a policy statement entitled, Ensuring Comprehensive Care and Support for Transgender and Gender Diverse Children and Adolescents, the group recommends gender-affirming health care for minors who do not identify with their birth sex. In some cases, here we go, this includes surgical intervention, as well as using, I don't know how to say it, uh, gonadotrophin, uh, releasing hormones, it's a drug that releases hormones or whatever, uh, to delay puberty up to the age 16, and prevent the development of some sex characteristics, such as breasts and deeper voice. That's right, I just read that. In case you didn't catch it, let me say this again. In some cases, this includes surgical intervention as well as using hormones to delay puberty up to the age 16 and prevent the development of some sex characteristics such as breasts and deeper voice. Yeah, you hear what I'm having to say about that? Exactly, nothing, because I don't know what to say to that. I mean, let's let's look at this for a second. Let's let's break it down. Um, as a child or in your adolescence, isn't this one of the most important times of your life? Because, from my understanding, you're in that development phase. Uh, physically, your brain is developing. Physically, your the rest of your body's developing. Gender-wise, uh, sexual organs and 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 your mind. Your mind, psychologically, you're developing as well. You're part of your environment. You're taking it all in, and that's how your brain begins to structure things, right? Now, I'm not a doctor. I'm not an MD. I didn't go to school for 4 million years to get that degree. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt, of course. This is just my opinion. <clears throat> all right. Um, the AAP statement, which, by the way, is uh, the American Academy for Pediatrics. All right, this is a uh, this is their statement cites statistics showing trans showing transgender individuals are more likely to suffer from depression, anxiety, eating disorder, self-harm and suicide, all of which the group blames on inadequate health care and social stigma. General diverse youth must be assured that transgender aspects of hum trans excuse me, gender diverse youth must be assured that transgender identities and diverse gender expressions do not constitute a mental disorder and are normal aspects of human diversity. So they're saying that these, uh, being a gender diverse youth, which I'm assuming, like I said, I haven't really done much research on this. And if you guys want me to in the comments, I will put together something on this and do a lot of research. But gender diverse, I guess, is where you're, um, you know, you're, you're questioning your gender um, and all of that jazz. 
is I'm I'm assuming that's what they're talking about based off certain context here. It says gender diverse youth must be assured that transgender identities and diverse gender expressions do not constitute mental disorder and or normal aspects of human diversity. Now, I don't recall me ever questioning my gender or my attraction to the opposite sex to females. <laughs> I remember being attracted to the opposite sex. Boy, puberty came with a vengeance. It hit me hard. But I don't honestly remember questioning myself on any of that. Like, I don't think it really... And now, and now, let me say this, too. I come from a background where I was physically, mentally, and sexually abused. And one of those sexually abuses was actually by the same, uh, same gender um, when I was a kid. But even then, I don't really recall questioning, like, my attractions. It was just, like, naturally there. You know, I was attracted to females. Um, but... That being said, uh, the reason I'm saying this is I almost wonder if a lot of kids do, as they're growing up, kind of have those questions, though. I would assume that most do. I probably did and just don't remember it. That'd be my guess. Meanwhile, so-called conversion therapies are unfair and deceptive and have been proven to be not only unsuccessful, but also, uh, I don't know what that word is, deleterious. I need to look it up and are considered outside the mainstream of traditional medical practice. Now I'm sure it's a negative. It has a negative connotation, of course. Uh, all right. Now bear with me. I'm getting somewhere. I know I'm kind of reading through this, but just bear with me. There's a wait till you get down here to where you see the blue and red. Seriously. <clears throat> As pediatricians and parents, we also appreciate how challenging and at times confusing it can be for family members to realize their children's experience and feelings, said uh, Cora Browner, MD, who chairs the AAP Committee on Adolescence. What is most important is for a uh, parent to listen, respect, and support their child's self-expressed identity, said Jason Rafferty, uh, MD, the lead author of, the pol of this policy that we're talking about. This encourages open conversations that may be difficult, but key to child's to the child's mental health and the family's resilience and well-being. Those of us in the medical community stand prepared for to help them," said. I don't know how to say her name, so please forgive me. Member of the AAP section of Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Health and Wellness. <clears throat> Here we go. The AAP's new official prescription for treating LGBT youth come as the debate continues to rage in the medical community about gender dysphoria. Some experts have cast doubt on what progressive scientists have maintained is the correct approach to gender, gender dysphoria in children. In 2016, Dr. Kenneth Zucker was fired after decades at the prestigious Child, Youth, and Family Gender Identity Clinic over his more cautious treatment of gender dysphoric children. <laughs> they said over his more cautious treatment, meaning he was not going as extreme as they wanted him to. Lisa Lippman, an assistant professor of behavioral and social sciences at Brown University School of Public Health, also sparked controversy with a study suggesting that some of children with symptoms of general uh, gender dysphoria were actually suffering from sec separate psychiatric conditions, an unpopular hypothesis among progressives. What are you saying here is um, that Lisa Lippman sparked controversy um, with a study that she did suggesting that some children with symptoms of this, what we they're calling gender dysphoria, were actually suffering from separate psychiatric conditions. Separate psychiatric conditions. Meaning that the cause of this, what was their list they gave earlier? Their list was um, that children were suffering from depression, anxiety, eating disorders, uh, self-harm and suicide and all that jazz that they're saying. What Lisa Littman found with her study is that um, many of these children with those symptoms or, or those behaviors... Uh, that 
are linked to gender dysphoria were actually suffering from separate psychiatric conditions, which is, of course, they had to put this in there, an unpopular hypothesis among these progressive scientists. Interesting. Hmm. So, before we go further, because this, this last little bit I'm going to read will tie it together. What they're saying is, like, uh, Lisa Lippman with that study, and even uh, Dr. Kenneth Zucker was cited here, um, who was fired for a cautious treatment of this gender dysphoric um, treatment, is that a lot of the causes are from other psychiatric conditions, not gender dysphoria. Very interesting. So if you stop and think about that for a moment, they're implementing these practices, these prescriptions, if you will, of not only like drugs, but psychologically and a lot of other stuff, the way that the approach that they're, these progressive scientists are saying they should take when a lot of times, according to the study that Lisa Littman was involved with, it has nothing to do with this gender dysphoria. It's actually other psychiatric conditions. But of course, as I said at the bottom of that, that paragraph, an unpo this is an unpopular hypothesi uh, hypothesis excuse me, among these progressive scientists. So, let me guess. If we continue to treat these children, that's right, I said children, children, children. If we continue to treat children, if we continued, continue to treat these children for gender dysphoria, even though it quite possibly could be not gender dysphoria, but just other psychiatric conditions, what would happen? What, what kind of outcome would that bring? Because remember, in your development stage, as a child and adolescent, it shapes your future. It really, truly does. So if we treat them for, uh, with this accepted practice by these progressive uh, scientists for gender dysphoria, for other psychiatric conditions, would it have an adverse effect? What would it do? It's kind of interesting if you really think about it. And I hope you're following me on this. I I'm trying to like dumb it down. I'm not very eloquent at stating what it is I'm trying to say. So I... Uh, I hope you're following me here. Now, let's finish this up. Meanwhile, the American College of Pediatrics has been vilified as a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center and others for urging caution against hastily encouraging adolescents to embrace a gender identity other than their birth gender. <laughs> of course they are. All right. Adolescence is a time of upheaval and imper impermanence. The ACP wrote in a 2010 letter to school superintendents, adolescents experience confusion about many things, including sexual orientation and gender identity, and they are particularly uh, vulnerable to environmental influences. Let me go ahead and give that a red. That deserves a red color right there because that's very important. Is that not what I was just saying? particularly vulnerable to environmental influences. So, with all the confusion these children are experiencing, and the adolescents are experiencing, um, with uh, sexual orientation and gender identity and whatnot, well, they still become products of their environment. Now, if their environment is telling them that they have to question their identity... Or tell them whatever these practices are that these progressive scientists are using to treat gender dysphoria. Well, gee, what's going to happen when they get older? Hmm. Furthermore, I'd like to say, let's go back to the top. In some cases, this includes surgical intervention as well as using hormones to delay puberty up to age 16 and prevent the development of some sex characteristics such as breasts and deeper voice. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm having a problem with this. The more I read this article and the more I talk about it, the angrier, angrier I am getting. And here's why. 
Well, probably the same reason you are. These are kids. Enough said there. These are kids. And they're trying to dictate their identities. And they're taking kids who have psychiatric issues and treating them for gender dysphoria, as they call it. According to that study. I'd like to see that study, actually. If you guys want to know more about this one, let me know. Just somebody, one, all it takes one person to say, yeah, let's find out more or make a comment on this. And I'll do a full scale uh, video cast on this uh, issue. Because uh, I am kind of curious, but I'm not going to put the time into it unless you guys want me to. So, What else do we have here? Let's move on. Dan Bongino. For those of you who do not know who Dan Bongino is, here, I'll pull it up. We're over at Conservative Review now. We'll go to podcast real quick and pull that up. This is Dan Bongino. He has a radio show, nationally syndicated. I believe it's nationally syndicated. Um, but he also has a podcast, so that can be nationally syndicated. Um, he's former um, Secret Service. He's former Secret Service. I think he did, what, 10, 12 years as a federal agent. Um, the guy is highly intelligent, very smart, and he's a riot. He's a trip. He's a very funny guy. Very funny guy. But uh, he lays all the information out for you. And he just released a book recently called uh, Spygate. That's what he, I think he dubbed that name, Spygate, to the whole issue with the silent coup that I'm so big on. He called it Spygate, where he lays it all out. And I haven't read it yet. I plan to get to it. And, of course, I love Dan. If you guys never heard of him, go check him out. Dan Bongino right here. Anyways, so this article on Conservative Review, review written by Chris Pandolfo, uh, Dan Bongino explains the one key thing the declassified Carter Page FISA application will reveal. Now, let's backtrack for a second here. This is probably, in my opinion, the most news newsworthy uh, topic to talk about today. I wanted to get to this. And I honestly haven't done too much research on it. Like I told you, I just kind of sat down, started reading the articles, and said, you know what? It's time to start the podcast again. So, or excuse me, video cast. I've been corrected by somebody, so I got to call it a video cast. Apparently, President Trump has finally decided to release and declassify all the information on the FISA warrants that were pulled to spy on his uh, campaign. Now, of course, when I say spy on his campaign, they were to spy on somebody lower in his campaign. But with the two-hop rule, meaning if they spy on one person and they look through the emails and they link to another person or calls or what have you, then they can jump to that person as well. And then they can do it again. So before you know it, it's like a web and they can just spy on the entire campaign, which I personally believe, like I said, it's my belief. That was the whole point in the first place, was so that the administration could spy on the Trump campaign to help uh, gather intelligence to ensure President Trump's opposition, Hillary Clinton, and the Democrats were able to get into the executive office for the next term. So President Trump decided to re release it, and there is a Twitter that I want to read. It was a statement from the White House. The White House Office of Press Secretary, statement from the press secretary, I can barely read this. Let's see if we can zoom that in a little bit. At the request of a number of committees of Congress, and for reasons of transparency, the President has directed the Office of Director of National Intelligence and the Department of Justice, including the FBI, to provide for the immediate declassification of the following material. Pages blah 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 of the June 2017 application to the FISA court in the matter of Carter um, Page. Whoa, what just happened? In the matter of Carter Page. All FBI reports of interviews with Bruce G. Orr um, in connection with the Russian investigation and all FBI reports of interviews prepared in connection with all Carter Page FISA applications. In addition, President Donald Trump has directed the Department of Justice, including the FBI, <laughs> to publicly release all text messages relating to the Russian investigation. Here we go. Without redaction of James Comey, Andrew McKay, Peter Strzok. His name, I love his name, Strzok. He's a scumbag, but I love his name. Peter Strzok. His, uh, 
his girlfriend, Lisa Page, and Bruce Orr. Now, let's backtrack a little bit for those of you who uh, live in a box and haven't been listening to my previous pod, not podcast, video cast. See, see, I'm getting it right. I'm getting it right. Video cast. Oh, where to begin now that I think about it? Go back and watch the, the video cast and you'll find out. But needless to say, all the text messaging between um, Peter Strzok and... Lisa Page. Lisa Page was an attorney for the FBI. Peter Strzok was uh, was one of the lead investigators uh, in the FBI. He was, you know, he's pretty high up the chain. Who now both of them have been fired, by the way. They released text messages um, while back, back in 2017, early 18, that were heavily redacted, but it showed the major bias um, using things like, and I'm not really quoting, I'm kind of paraphrasing here. Don't worry, we have a backup plan or, you know, stuff like that, saying Trump will never make it into the executive branch. He'll never become president. Now, this is the guy who was investigating Trump. This is also the guy who was investigating the Hillary campaign or Hillary Clinton, excuse me, for her alleged use of uh, the private server and classified information getting out, which we now know for sure did actually get out. But they just went ahead and let it go. <laughs> Anyways, um, so those will be unredacted. There will be no more uh, black lines across the paper. And that's great. Now, the FISA court, the FISA warrant that were used to, to spy on Carter. Carter worked in the, uh, in the Trump, administ- or the Trump uh, campaign. The FBI used the dossier to bas- essentially get permission to collect intelligence on Carter Page. Now, remember what I told you, the two-hop the two hop rule, where they can hop around before you know it, they've got a dragnet over the whole campaign. Um, and that's what they did. The significance of releasing all this is we will know, without all the redactions, what information they used to obtain those warrants from the FISA courts. Uh, and we know for sure that the, uh, the salacious... Fake, as 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 Comey put it, salacious and unverified uh, dossier was a major player. Um, so we will find out if there was anything else. Which I bet my bottom dollar there wasn't anything else that was extraordinary. How do I know? Ask me how I know. Somebody, please ask me how I know. Go ahead and say it in the comment. Because the number two at the FBI, FBI, uh, Andrew McCabe said it. He said without the dossier, we wouldn't have been able to (laughs) look into this. That was their main piece of evidence, which, like James Comey said in front of Congress, (laughs) was salacious and unverified. (laughs) It was a load of crap. It was garbage. There was nothing true about it. Um, And now Bruce Orr, Bruce Orr, where he comes into play is he was high up in the FBI as well. Well, his wife, and I forgot her name, and just for the sake of time, I don't feel like looking it up, worked for Fusion GPS. While Fusion GPS had access to the NSA databases, which is a whole nother story, by the way. But just just run with me here. Yes, Fusion GPS had access to the NSA databases because third parties are able to access that kind of information in that database for certain purposes when a government agency that does have access to it brings them in. Now, the the key thing there is it it never got cut off. It was supposed to, but it didn't. It never actually got cut off, so they still had access to it. Pretty interesting stuff. I'll do a podcast solely on that. But anyways, I don't want to get into that right now. But she worked for Fusion GPS, and of course, uh, they hired out uh, uh, Steel to come up with uh, opposition research on President Trump, and that's where he came up with the dossier, him and some Russian people. Um, So that guy colluded with the Russians to put something together to smear then-candidate Trump. Now, why do I bring up Fusion GPS? Why do I bring up Bill uh, Bruce Orr? Why do I bring up his wife? Because she worked for Fusion GPS, who then funneled that information, the dossier, over to the FBI. Well, who works high up in the FBI? Her husband, Bruce Orr. Are you putting the lines together? Are you connecting the dots here? 
Yes, it's all starting to come together. And that's the beauty of what I said should be the, you know, the, the top thing to talk about today is that President Trump is declassifying the FISA applications. Um, so what, what will it reveal? There's a lot of things that it'll tell us. I don't want to get into all of that until I actually see it because I'll speculate and be wrong all day. I have to actually see it. Um, I've been wrong before. You know, I'm just going, what I'm doing is putting together what we do know as fact, um, which leads me to where I'm at today. We know all of this happened. We know it was a deep state coup. There's no doubt about it. And anybody that denies it is just, well, they're just ignorant. Um, and they're blinded for whatever reasons. Take your pick. Uh, usually party politics. That's why. We know the Russian investigation is nothing. We also know that, the, that um, Robert Mueller has nothing. And I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, well, they, they got, they got uh, Paul Manafort on eight counts over in Alexandria on the rocket docket. And now uh, he went ahead and struck a deal and plugged guilty in D.C. Right. But where's the collusion? There is none. They got him on what? Uh, lying, um, falsifying tax information, that kind of stuff. They didn't get him on anything colluding at all. <laughs> They've got nothing on him. The inve Russia investigation with uh, Robert Mueller has fallen apart. Um, and now you have President Trump. And I think he waited to this point to release this. I knew, he was, he, I knew he'd do it. it. It's probably in his best interest to do it. But it's kind of interesting, his timing with releasing it, with what's going on after Manafort, after now we know that uh, Robert Mueller's running out of uh, tricks to pull out of his pocket here. He got nobody to roll on President Trump, not even his attorney. His attorney pled guilty to two charges that actually didn't even happen, <laughs> that weren't even breaking the law. <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, I'll talk forever on that one. I know I'm kind of jumping all over the place. I don't even know if you're still following me anymore. But that is the beauty of this. This is going to help bring it all together. So I'm glad that they finally decided to release it. And I'll let you listen to what Dan Bongino says. All right, welcome to the Mark Levin Show. And by the way, this is him on the Mark Levin Show. Um, he's filling in for Mark Levin, the great one. Mark Levin Show. That is not the voice of the great one. It's your old buddy, Dan Bongino, out of the bullpen. Filling in for Mark. He'll be back this week, though. Have no fear. What to do? What to do? Breaking news. Thank you, President Trump. Nice job. He's finally agreed to declassify portions of the FISA document, the Bruce Orr FBI interview 302s, and a bunch of texts. Ladies and gentlemen, here it comes. Here it comes. I have been waiting on this for, gosh, a year and a half now. This has been my life, this case. And I'm absolutely sure now that whether the, whether the media, because the media will never agree that Spygate, the whole thing was a, you know, the Russian collusion thing was a hoax, but that Spygate is very real, the spying operation, right? Whether they agree or not, the information that's about to come out, I am sure of it, I would bet my entire professional reputation on it, is, I'm not going to say, uh, is, is, is like the straw that broke the camel's back, because the camel's back was broken a long time ago. The media just didn't acknowledge it. This is like, it, it, this is going to be a gusher. There's going to be no, if you still believe in the collusion hoax, please, please, contact a family member. Go seek professional mental help immediately. After this stuff comes out, you are going, listen to me, listen closely. I'm going to get to Kavanaugh, I got a bunch of stuff, I'm sorry, but this just, this just broke before we came on the air. So we're going to be jumping around a little bit, just deal with me. You know I don't ever steal you wrong, so we'll get back on track eventually. Just give me a second to get all this together, right? But if you still believe in this collusion hoax, please, please seek professional help. You are about to be utterly, completely humiliated. You are about to be embarrassed. You are about to look like such a fool on your social media networks amongst your friends. And liberals are going to be sitting around in support groups looking at each other like, my name is uh, liberal Joey Bag of Donuts, and I am a believer in the collusion fairy tale. Folks, it is not real. Now that this stuff is about to be declassified, you are going to see one key thing. That this entire case, from minute one, 
was based on one big, fat hoax perpetrated by people working for Hillary Clinton in the form of this filthy, disgusting dossier with not a scintilla of actual information in it. All right, I'm going to get to that because I've got a lot to go. I really, it, I, even though the storyline here is simple, you've been, you've been screwed. If you believe in this, you, you've been hoaxed. It's now going to come out. <laughs> Thank you. My wife's texting me. I love you too, sweetheart. You're the best. <laughs> you know I'm on the air right now, right? She's just like texting me. You want Chipotle or Chick-fil-A? I'm like, whatever, either one. I'm good. It's a hoax. It's a hoax. You got hoaxed. When are you going to give this up? How long are you going to hold on to this fairy tale? I say Chick-fil-A, Dan. Chick-fil-A. Chipotle? Eh, don't really like it. Their, their queso is disgusting, man. Matter of fact, I'll go, I'll go further, and I'll say Qdoba. All right, anyways, so I know Dan didn't really give us much there, I guess, but whatever. Anyway, you get the point. So he's excited. Um, and like I said, he's very well in tune with what's going on. He's a great source of information. Uh, I haven't got to read his book yet. It's called Spygate. Go check it out. Um, not endorsing him, by the way. I'm just saying, you know, go check it out. Read it for yourself. I will read it myself eventually. Uh, but I've learned a lot of information from uh, Mr. Bongino. Anyways, what else should we talk about today? Let's let's uh, let's see. Let's go ahead and take a look here. Oh. Uh, Oh, you guys know who that is, right? Isn't that Senator Frankenfeinstein? It is, isn't it? Oh, so why don't we move on to Kavanaugh for a second. And take a quick look. Senate Judiciary Chair Grassley. Diane Frankenfeinstein's office refuses to cooperate on Kavanaugh accusers' procedure. Here's yet more proof that Democrats are playing dirty with Kavanaugh. Now, this is, uh... This is, uh, Kavanaugh has been nominated by President Trump, for those of you who don't know, living under a box, of course, um, for the Supreme Court to take, uh, uh, Associate Justice Roberts, uh, no, no, excuse me, Kennedy's position, because he is retiring. He's decided to go ahead and leave, and of course the Democrats are up in arms about this, because now President Trump now has his second pick <laughs> for the court. Uh, anyways, the reason I want to touch on this one is I just want to take the chance to make myself feel better because I'm not feeling so great today by pointing out the typical dirty tricks that the Democrats play that are so obvious. Um, so I figured this article is a perfect opportunity for me to do that. So um, anyways, Senate Republicans want to follow up with Kavanaugh's accuser. What happened was, let me, let me actually, let me preface with this. Okay, so Franken... Uh, Feinstein, Diane, Senator Franken, Diane, uh, Diane Franken Feinstein, Franken Feinstein, Franken Feinstein. Yes, her name's not Franken Feinstein. I just like to say that because it makes fun of her. She, uh, she received back in July information from this lady named Ford, who we just found out who she was just recently, of course. The information was a bit suppressed. And she handed it over to the FBI for investigation and said, I've handed over information on Kavanaugh because he's going through all his hearings and everything through Congress to make sure that he's fit to be on the Supreme Court. And she says that she submitted it to the FBI. And of course, the FBI kicked it back and said, eh, no, we're not even looking into this. We're not even going to take the time. This doesn't even deserve us looking at it or just making a couple phone calls. The information... Was, alleges that Brett Kavanaugh, back in high school in the 80s, uh, may have, I believe it was either sexually assaulted or attempted to sexually assault a young woman um, that was in his class, this uh, Dr. Ford. Look at the timing with all this, and we're about to hear that. We're just going to read a little bit of this article, and you're about to see what I'm talking about. But pay attention to the timing of this, and you will see what the Democrats always do. See, they have a process. All right, they have a process. They will do a character assassination. First, they'll, they'll flood it with money. Then they'll do a character assassination. If that doesn't work, they'll even move towards um, deposing somebody, right? They try to destroy anybody that's in opposition to them. So it's kind of funny how this same situation, these allegations that have popped up at the last minute, mind you, 
is something that they always do every single time who was it was it down in who was the guy down in just recently running down in south carolina or was that was that georgia anyways they did the same thing to him you know like it's just they do it every single time and i'm gonna tell you right now what are the odds i wish i was were a mathematician i'm horrible with numbers but what what are the odds that every single candidate that's a conservative or I'll even go so far as to say that's a Republican, because not all Republicans are conservative, is either racist, sexist, or has sexually assaulted a woman. Have you noticed that every single Republican that has ever run is accused by the Democrats of that? There are always these allegations. Then they, and here's the best part. They always show up at the last minute. It's, it's, it's so funny how that always happens. So what are the odds? That it's true every single time for every single candidate. I mean, well, what would the numbers be? If you're a mathematician and you know numbers well, I want you to give me, give me a ratio. Give me something, please, in the comments. <laughs> Anyways, you get my point. Senate Republicans want to follow up Kavanaugh's accuser, uh, Christine Bailey Ford, in the regular order of the Senate confirmation process. What's supposed to happen is that an update to a nominee's background will be discussed in private phone calls between each party and the committee. If necessary, additional testimony may be required, but the phone calls should come before the committee reaches that point. <clears throat> but a statement from Senate Judiciary Committee uh, Chair Chuck Grassley, who's a Republican from Iowa, says that Senator Dianne Franken-Feinstein's office is refusing to cooperate in the follow-up on Ford's accusations. Huh. Well, gee, uh, Senator um, Grassley, I wonder why that is. Here's the statement. Anyone who comes forward, as Dr. Ford has, has, deserves to be heard. So I will continue working on a way to hear her out in an appropriate, uh, precedented, and respectful manner. Well, good for you, uh, Senator Grassley. I'm glad that you're willing to do that. The standard procedure for updates to any nominee's background investigation file is to conduct separate follow-up calls, here we go, with relevant parties. In this case, that would entail phone calls with at least Judge uh, Kavanaugh and Dr. Ford. So basically, that would be to follow up with them and kind of connect the dots, find out what's going on, and look into these allegations. Consistent with that practice, I asked Senator Frankenfeinstein's office yesterday to join me in scheduling these follow-ups. Thus far, they have refused. Let me say that again. Thus far, they have refused. Well, why don't they want uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee um, and its chair, uh, Chuck Grassley, Senator Chuck Grassley, to look into these allegations? Why won't they let him connect the dots? Because this is... They're claiming this is important information, right? These are these are some serious allegations. Hmm. Remember, character assassination. And furthermore, which I know this is irrelevant, but I'm just going to say it anyways, aren't there statute of limitations? But I digress. Of course, character assassination. We need to find out who he really is. Now, Judge Kavanaugh, before we go any further, let me say this. Judge Kavanaugh um, was secretary for President George Bush, uh, that's Jr., and he was also appointed to the lower federal courts. Now, in these processes, you have to go through a rigorous federal uh, background check. I mean, rigorous. They can take like eight months sometimes. You know, I mean, serious. They, they really do. They pull everything up. They go, they go knocking doors, talking to people from your childhood. How come this never popped up then? I guess the FBI doesn't know what they're doing, right? Or am I wrong? Maybe uh, the FBI do know what they're doing. I don't know. Just a thought there. Anyways, but it's never popped up. So now he's going through his third one, you know, and he may have had another investigation. I don't know. Or a background check. I don't know. But those are the two I know of. So at least two plus the one he's going through now with the with the Senate. It's kind of interesting how they never popped up before. But here they are in the 11th hour. And what do I mean by the 11th hour? You're about to find out. Unfortunately, committee Republicans have only known this person's identity from news reports for the less than 24 hours and known about her allegations for less than a week. Senator Franken-Feinstein, on the other hand, has had this information for many weeks and deprived her colleagues of the information necessary to do our jobs. The majority withheld 
uh, excuse me, the minority withheld even the anonymous uh, allegations for six weeks. There it is. She held on to this information for six weeks. Why do you think that is? Only to later decide that they were serious enough to investigate on the eve of the committee vote. To investigate on the eve of the committee vote. So literally, at the 11th hour, right before the Senate Judiciary Committee, who was headed by uh, Chairman Chuck Grassley, of course, as I've said 30 times now, uh, after the vetting process had been completed, meaning they'd finished the background checking, the vetting process, the Senate Judiciary Committee's getting ready to vote, and then she, she pops this up, which she's been sitting on for six weeks. Standard Democrat procedure. That's what it sounds like to me. It's deeply disturbing that the existence of these allegations were leaked in a way that seemed to preclude Dr. Ford's confidentiality. Over my nearly four decades in the Senate, I have worked diligently to protect whistleblowers and get to the bottom of any issue. Dr. Ford's attorney could have approached my office while keeping her client confidential and anonymous so that these allegations could be thoroughly investigated. Nevertheless, we are working diligently to get to the bottom of these claims. All right, so we'll we'll read this real quick. So these, so let's recap how Franken Feinstein has played this. In July, let me say it again. In July, in July, in July, Franken Feinstein's office received a confidential letter from Ford detailing her accusations. Franken Feinstein sat on this letter for two months, for two months, for two months, for two months. For two months, failing to bring it back to the public or the full committee's attention throughout Kavanaugh's public testimony. Then, the week before the committee was set to vote to advance uh, Kavanaugh to the full Senate uh, for confirmation, Franken Feinstein announced she had referred the letter to the FBI for a criminal investigation against Kavanaugh. She did not announce what the accusations against him are or who is making them. The American people had to wait. For that information to be leaked to the media before Kavanaugh's accuser, Ford, could, uh, came forward with her allegations for the first time in 36 years. <whistles> Man. Senate Republicans are obviously uh, disrupted. Now, you know what? We won't even read that. There's no need to. This is Franken... Feinstein and the Senate Democrats using any means necessary, even destroying a man's reputation, character assassination, character assassination, character assassination, character assassination, to politicize the Supreme Court nomination process and prevent a constitutional textualist from sitting on the court. It's unethical. It's disgusting. It's the Democratic Party. Let me say that one more time. It's unethical. It's disgusting. It's the Democratic Party. Man, I am so going to steal that because it is so true. So let's recap here. Senator Franken Feinstein had the information since July. She sat on it. Okay, fine. I'll give her that. Maybe she was looking into it, right? Seeing is this really, is this, uh, does it really hold any weight? You know, let's, let's do, before we submit it to the FBI or get it in front of Congress, let's look into it. I'll give them that much. Okay, do your due diligence. So they sit on it, they sit on it, they sit on it. After the vetting process finished, so they decided not to use it. How do we know? Because the vetting process finished. If they were going to use it, they should have used it during the vetting process, right? So the vetting process finishes. Now the uh, committee's getting ready to vote, and then she releases it. And when I say releases, she tells everybody she's submitting this anonymous information to the FBI for investigation, which the FBI... Uh, Subsequently said, uh, you can take that and shove it because it holds no ground whatsoever. Now, that being said, if this Miss uh, Dr. Ford, this really did happen to her, well, obviously, then we should know that before voting on Kavanaugh. I, I truly do, you know, mean that. But at the same time, that's not my point. My point here is their tactics. Look at the way they do it every single time. What are the odds? Seriously, somebody comment and tell me, what are the odds that every time a candidate for the Republican Party is either racist, sexist, or, uh, you know, some sexual assault of some sort? 
Seriously, what are the odds that every single one of them have done it? Like, look at McCain. God rest his soul. Rest in peace. Remember him? Remember when he ran for office? For president? And he had the nomination from the Republican Party? Remember how he was a racist? I don't know if you remember that one. I remember it very well. I remember the character assassination. I remember all the allegations. Then when he passed away, he was God. He was such an awesome, great man. But when he was running for president, he was a racist. Remember? And all the other crap they spewed at him. Typical Democrat politics. It's what they do. They don't have any standing. They don't have any issues to debate. They don't have any sound policies. All they have is identity politics. That's all they've got. That's their base. They whip up their base by using identity politics. And they spread a bunch of hate and get people to march in lockstep with them. That's what they do by telling lie after lie after lie, accusation after accusation after accusation. And they dress it up. And they wrap it in the American flag. And they say, we've got to put a stop to this. And people buy it. Hook, line, and sinker. That's what, at least today, that's, that's what you see. That's your Democratic Party right there, in a nutshell. Identity politics. So that's, that's uh, Frank and Feinstein for you. Of course, that's what they did. And like it or not, Kavanaugh will be sitting on the, uh, on the court. Sorry, Frank and Feinstein. I don't know what to tell you. You're just going to have to suck it up. And I'll tell you what. Another thing is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I listened to, watched a recording of her the other day. She can barely talk. She can barely talk. How much longer, and I don't mean to get morbid here or insensitive, but how much longer can she sit on that court? I mean, seriously. I know it's a life appointment, but how much longer is she going to be around? I mean, the inevitable is coming. It happens to all of us. We all pass away. We all die. But look at her. She may be... I'm just guessing, and I know this sounds so insensitive, and I don't mean for it to, but uh, we're just talking about the issues anyways. She may be the next one to go, most likely. That's my best guess, which would mean a third one for President Trump. And, of course, if he's elected for a second term, well, he'll definitely be replacing her seat. Possibly even one more. Could you imagine? (laughs) The balance would be way off at that point. Anyways, so some pretty interesting stuff we covered today. I'm glad to be back, guys. Um, we'll go ahead and cut the po- video cast. I almost said it again. We'll go ahead and cut the pit, uh, the video cast. Uh, glad to be back. Remember, subscribe. Uh, I've got two new video casts coming out. They're going to be big. I think one of them is going to be the best one yet. One of them is real estate investment. I'm a real estate investor, and I'm going to start taking you along on all my adventures. I do it on a national scale. I invest in 16 different states. Come watch me do it. Come see how I do it. Ask me questions. That kind of thing. And the other one, of course, being uh, Project Blackfish is what it's called. And that'll be understanding and history and knowledge and just searching and looking through the deep uh, dark net and the deep web. Yes, they are two separate things, by the way, for those of you who didn't know. Um... So we will be going through that as well. We'll be looking at all types of things. There's so many things we can look into on the dark web and the deep net. So it'll be a lot of fun. And wait till you see how it's played out. I think it's going to turn out really, really well. I think you guys will like it. But you got to be subscribed here for me to let you know when they're coming out. So go ahead and subscribe. That being said, this is Weasel saying good day.